Amen. First thing I want to point out in Luke chapter 12 is that there's a lot of hard preaching in this chapter. Yeah. But Jesus is really coming off some even harder preaching in chapter 11. And I want to just point that out. At the very end of chapter 11, he says in verse 49, Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers, for you've taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. So Jesus preaching pretty hard. He's taking the Pharisees to task. He's taking the lawyers to task. And then in verse 53, it says that as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently. I mean, they're getting mad and they're trying to provoke him to speak of many things. Look at the next, and it says laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. But look at the next verse, the first verse of chapter 12. In the meantime, when there was gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And the first thing I want to point out here is that hard preaching drew an innumerable multitude in this passage. I mean, in the midst of Jesus preaching really hard, calling out false religion, calling out the phonies, and then he's doing it before and after verse 1, and yet verse 1 says that in the meantime, there's gathered unto him an innumerable multitude. So it's a lie today when you hear people say that hard preaching is going to turn people away. Right. It's going to turn people off. People can't handle it. People can actually handle a lot more than you think. And if pastors today in America would just get up in their pulpit this Sunday morning and just really just cut loose and preach and just take the gloves off and take the filter off and just get up and just preach the Word of God as it's written and tell it like it is and apply it to the day we live in with no regard for the face of man, I guarantee you the vast majority of people that are in actual Bible-believing churches where the people are actually saved are going to be able to handle it. They're going to be able to take it. You know, it's the leadership that's failing in this country. The people in the pew can handle so much more. It's just that the pastors are not dishing it out. You can have a big church and still preach hard. You don't have to be tired. I don't like this attitude that says, well, if you preach hard, you'll never be big. Well, that's not really true because we've seen in the past churches that preached hard growing and, and becoming large. Our church is growing, and as independent fundamental Baptist churches go, our church is very large, and our church is growing quickly, and our church is one of the largest independent Baptist churches even in Arizona now. Why? Because hard preaching doesn't scare people away except the, the kind of people that you want to scare away. It keeps all the weirdos out. But hard preaching can still gather a multitude today. You don't have to choose between reaching a lot of people and preaching hard. You can do both. Our church has hard preaching and we reach a lot of people. We don't have to choose. So we don't need this defeated attitude that says, well, if you preach hard, you can't grow. And we don't need the scared attitude in the pulpit that says, well, you know, if I preach hard, I'm going to run everybody off. It just isn't true. And Christ proved it right here. But he says there in his preaching to this great multitude at the end of verse 1, he said, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Now Jesus at various times in his ministry spoke about the leaven of the Pharisees. Here he says that the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. Elsewhere, the Bible said that when he talked about the leaven of the Pharisees, he was referring to their doctrine. Now, why was the false doctrine of the Pharisees called their leaven? I believe it's in Matthew chapter 15, somewhere uh, around that neighborhood in the book of Matthew. The reason why that doctrine that they taught was known as leaven is because if you remember, leaven could be hid in three measures of meal and then the whole thing is leavened. Right? Leaven spreads, it grows, 
It's, it's, it's something that multiplies. Leaven is what we know today as yeast, or we could know it as a bacteria. Something that multiplies and grows and it causes bread to rise. And it pictures sin in the Bible, which is why the, the, the body of Jesus Christ was, was uh, pictured by the unleavened bread right. with no yeast in it, right? And then obviously the, the unleavened fruit of the vine, the unfermented, not with yeast in it, uh, which is, by the way, what ferments alcohol in grape juice is the yeast on the outside of the grapes. So it was the unfermented fruit of the vine and it was the unleavened bread because it's a picture of sin there. So leaven, what does leaven have to do with doctrine? Because if you get a false doctrine, it'll spread to other doctrine in your life. Yeah. So when people get a false doctrine that's not biblical and they're not willing to let go of it and they hang on to it, what ends up happening is that they, they start getting a bunch of other false doctrine as well because they're looking at everything through that wrong lens or through those wrong glasses. And I heard a great illustration about this, like a guitar that has a string that's out of tune. So if you get one string out of tune on the guitar, the logical thing to do is to tune that string and now you're playing again. But what some people want to do today, they have a false doctrine that they just will not let go of. So what they end up doing is trying to tune the other five strings to match that string. Now all six strings are tuned wrong. And if you just listen to that person play, it sounds good. Why? Because all six of their strings are in tune with each other, right? They've got a false doctrine. They got that bad string and they tuned the other five to match up with it. It's like, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, this sounds great, right? Yeah, until they start actually playing with the rest of the band, until the piano player starts playing, until the bass guitar starts playing, until the trumpet starts playing, until the song leader starts singing, and then it sounds horrible. Mm -hmm. But when they're all isolated by themselves, they're making sense until somebody actually pulls out a Bible, which is like the tuning fork, pulls out the Bible, which is a little electronic tuner, and says, whoa, buddy, you're way flat. Yeah, you, need to, you, know, you need to get tuned up to this thing but it all starts with just having one thing wrong. And we've seen that over the last week at the Prophecy Conference, all the different sermons about end times and everything. There, there's one thing you can't deny, and that is that the false doctrine of a pre-tribulation rapture goes hand in hand with the doctrine that the Jews are God's chosen people. This doctrine that's stuck in the Old Testament program of Israel and the physical nation those two things are hand in glove. If, if you can get people to see that they're wrong about the Jews, then they'll have no problem seeing that the rapture is after the tribulation and vice versa. But they've just tuned all their strings. But, but here's the sad thing about that crowd is that when they, they've got their, their pre-trib string out of tune, right? And then they, t they get their string out of tune on the Jews. Well, here's what they end up doing. They start tweaking the salvation string. Yeah. Because you'll notice that every single person who goes into a detailed explanation of the pre-trib rapture and actually tries to refute our film after the tribulation in any kind of a detailed way, you'll notice that they always end up teaching a oh, different salvation in the Old Testament, different salvation during the tribulation, and they teach that there are three gospels or three different programs. And you know what? It's, it's a wicked false doctrine. And I believe that when people, when people get to that point where they're that deep into it, where they're saying that there's three different gospels, let them be accursed at that point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it, but, but the, the, the most people who believe in the pre-trib rapture, they don't believe in the three gospels thing. They just haven't even studied the issue. Your average pre-tribber is just pre-trib because they're just doing that because that's what everybody has been telling them. They haven't actually studied the issue on their own for themselves, okay? But the ones who actually have studied it and they have delved into it and they're still pre-trib, you know, there's something wrong with those people. They're bad people. I said they're bad people. I mean, look, why don't they preach what the Bible says? Why don't they believe what the Bible says? You know, if you ask, it'll, it'll be given to you. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, it shall be opened unto you. How could somebody sincerely go to God's word and say, oh God, show me the truth, 
and read Matthew 24 and read Mark 13 and read Luke 21 or read 2 Thessalonians 2 and still walk away pre-trib unless they're a bad person. Yeah. Look, because what are they doing? They're, they're basically teaching lies, believing lies, ignoring what the scripture says. But like I said, 90 some percent of them, it's not that they're bad people. They just haven't even looked at it. They haven't studied it. They're, they're relying on other people's study of it. And they're just kind of going with the flow, riding the coattails. Of it. And some of them don't even want to study it because they don't want to be responsible for that knowledge. But the, and you say, well, what's the big deal? I mean, so what if people are, are wrong on the rapture? But you know what? It's indicative of every other area in their Bible study and every other area in their life. Because if they're refusing to acknowledge the truth on this, which is as plain as the nose on your face, what else are they going to ignore? And what kind of a person are they if they're scared to preach what the Bible says for fear of offending their preacher buddies and their Bible college alma mater? And if they're just, and, and you say, no, 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 Pastor Anderson, they, they really studied it hard and they're sincere, but they just can't figure it out. Then they're not even fit to be a pastor because they don't have enough intelligence to pastor. Amen. You know, they're not smart enough to pastor then if they can't figure out that it's not pre-trib. They need to step down because their IQ is too low at that yeah. point. But again, like I said, most of them, they just haven't looked at it. They just haven't even studied it. And you said, how dare you insult them? You know what? Somebody ought to insult them because I'm sick and tired of them persecuting anybody who actually read the Bible and believe what it says. The Bible says that they're the ones who are deceiving us by saying that the day of Christ is at hand. And the Bible says, let no man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come unless there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Anything other than that is a lie. And I can't even find one of these pre-tribbers who will even try to defend their doctrine without teaching this false salvation where they say, oh, it used to be salvation by works in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And in the tribulation, it's going to be salvation by works again. You know, when they're teaching different salvations and different gospels, that just shows they're a complete false prophet. Right. Right. So which side, you know, my message to the pastor of America would be, well, which side are you going to be on? You're going to be inside with the, the hyper dispensationalists with their three gospels that are cursed of the Lord. Or are you going to actually figure out that the, your big name heroes from the last generation were wrong on the timing of the rapture? Get over it. Move on with your life and believe what the Bible says. Amen. And nobody can provide any kind of a meaningful refutation of a post trip pre wrath rapture without appealing to the Ruckmanites, the hyper-dispensationalists, and the wrong salvation. It's that simple. And so, you know, people need to wake up. And the time is, is, is possibly going to come in our lifetime. It's pretty important that people know. Now, that's actually what this chapter is about. Jump down to verse 35. It's interesting because uh, we, we just sang the song, Will Jesus Find Us Watching?, and it's funny because as I was studying this chapter, that's the song that kept coming into my head because that song is based on this chapter. And then I thought it was pretty cool when I got here and I was, oh, that's what we're singing tonight. Perfect. But it says in verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed, and this is where the song comes from, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Now, what does it mean to be found watching? Well, all throughout the Bible, you'll find the word watch as in the first watch, second watch, third watch, fourth watch of the night. The word watch means to be awake, right? Those who watch all night until the morning are those who are staying up at night, right? And they're watching. Jesus Christ said to the disciples that fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, could you not watch with me for one hour? So the servants that are watching are the servants who are awake and paying attention to what's going on, right? As opposed to the ones who are asleep. That is the opposite of watching. It's to be asleep, right? So the Bible says, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find 
watching. Look at verse 38 and I'll prove it to you. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. So the night is broken up into these different watches of the night when they would maybe the guards would trade off, you know, the first watch, second watch, third watch of the night. Blessed are the servants that he finds watching, that are awake, that are paying attention, that know what to look for. It says in verse 39, and this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when you think not. Now, the pre-trib rapture doctrine is based on such a shallow understanding of Scripture, they don't even seek to understand what the Bible is actually teaching here, but instead they just grab hold of one sentence here, you know, be ready, you don't know what is coming. <laughs> that, that, it just becomes a, a slogan or a catchphrase. They don't realize that that's the tail end of his teaching. And they need to get the whole teaching not just the catchphrase, not just, ah, be, be ready, brother. You don't know when he's coming. It could be tonight. <laughs> Wrong. It could not be tonight. Right. The one who doesn't know when he's coming is the one who he's going to overtake as a thief. Yeah. Do you see that? I mean, look what he says here. It's, it's amazing how uh, people could not see this. It says, if, he, if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also. He's saying, be like that guy who's watching so that he knows when the thief is coming. Right? He's not saying, hey, we're all going to be surprised. We're all going to be shocked. He might have to come tonight. Wouldn't that be a surprise? It's not what it says. It says, be the guy who's awake and paying attention and ready so that you'll see him coming. Before he comes, you will be aware of it. You will be aware of when he's coming. I mean, isn't that what it says? It's pretty clear, right? Verse 40, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So we can't predict when he's coming, can we? Can any of us predict and say it's going to be on this date or on that date or this year or that year? We can't predict it. He's coming at an hour that we think not. It's, it's a date that nobody's predicting. It's not September 23rd, 2018, or any other goofball date that people come up with. You say, well, when is it then? Here's what, we have to stay awake all the time watching so that we can watch for the signs of his coming before they happen. Now, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So Luke chapter 12 goes into more detail on this. We're going to go back to Luke chapter 12 and see more detail about this idea of Christ's return and him coming upon people unawares, people not being ready. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the quintessential rapture passage. It's the most famous, most detailed. Everyone agrees that it's the rapture. All the pre-tribbers agree that it's the rapture. And they love to quote it. And they, they think in their warped understanding that somehow this provides a, a, a proof of a pre-tribulation rapture, even though in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there's no timing given. There's no timing of the rapture given in 1 Thessalonians 4. He describes the rapture. He tells us that it's going to happen, but he doesn't give the timing until chapter 5, verse 1, which they won't even touch with a 10-foot pole. They love to just comfort one another all day long. They're just so busy comforting one another in chapter 4, verse 18. They never even make it to chapter 5. And the Bible says in verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, but, but, but. See, there's this big but that they are not facing today. They won't even look at it. It's a conjunction. I mean, don't make me take you to conjunction junction to figure out what a conjunction is. I mean, it's not done. The book isn't over, right? And the most important stuff is coming in chapter 5 because he's going to explain to us the timing of the rapture, 
right? Because he says this, but of the times, I mean, isn't that pretty important? That sounds pretty relevant. I mean, we just finished explaining the rapture. Now we're going to talk about the timing. Great. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Why not? Why don't you need, why, why don't we need to know? For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, how in the world do they know that the day of the Lord's coming as a thief in the night? Somebody must have taught them that. You know who taught them that? Jesus Christ taught them that. And this is what's so foolish about this idea of, oh, Jesus never taught on the rapture. That was only revealed to us through Paul. Paul's our apostle to the Gentiles and blah, blah. Really, if Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles, why did Jesus give the great commission to all the apostles and tell them to teach all nations? Right. He commanded every one of those disciples to go reach the Gentiles. They just refused to do it, most of them. That's not his fault. But the point is that it says right here, that they already know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Isn't that the exact illustration that Jesus taught in Luke 12 when he said he's coming like a thief? And if the watchman, if the good men of the house would have known what time the thief was coming, he would have watched, you need to watch. Look, Jesus already taught the doctrine of the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night. So he says, well, I don't need to tell you about the timing because Christ already taught you the timing. Right? You already have heard what Jesus taught in Matthew 24. You've heard what Jesus taught in Luke 12. You're familiar with what Jesus taught in Luke 21. You're familiar with what Jesus taught in Mark 13. You're and, and I'm not saying they had those written books, but they'd heard that teaching. They'd heard that preaching of Christ's words from the apostles. And so Paul says, well, you don't need me to tell you of the times and seasons. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, let me ask you this. Is there any way possible to read these two verses and walk away saying that the day of the Lord is not the rapture? Because it wouldn't make any sense to tell us about the rapture and say, but of the times and seasons, you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as even light, unless the timing of the day of the Lord is the same timing as the timing of the rapture. That's the only way that would make any sense. I mean, it would be like, let's say, you know, um, uh, Brother Segura and myself, right? We're going to be going to a soul winning marathon in Timbuktu, right? And Brother Segura and I, we're both going to a soul winning marathon in Timbuktu. And we're both planning to arrive on the same day. We're flying on the same flight. We're sitting next to each other all the way there. We're going to land. We're going to do our soul winning. We're going to preach. And then we're going to fly home again on the same exact flight, right? And then what if I were to forward my itinerary to somebody in Timbuktu so that they could pick me up at the airport and know my schedule and know how to plan the event, right? And then if they say, well, you know, can you send me Brother Chris's itinerary as well? Well, you know what? Of the times and the seasons of Brother Chris Segura's arrival, you have no need that I write unto you because I've already sent you my itinerary. Yeah. Now, what if we were on totally different flights and arriving in totally different days? Would that make any sense? If they said, send us Brother Chris's itinerary, we want to pick him up at the airport. And I said, well, you already have my itinerary. <laughs> the only way that would make sense is if Chris and I are on the same plane. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? If Chris and I are on the same plane, then it makes sense. If you got the one itinerary, you, that's all you need. But if we were, that's the only way this verse makes any sense. He's saying, oh, the timing of the rapture? We well, already know that the day of the Lord's coming is a thief of the night. What does he mean by that? Of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. You already know what to look for. You already know what's going on with the timing of the rapture. You don't need me to tell you because you already know the day of the Lord's going to come as a thief of the night. Okay, everybody got that? Okay, well, what does the Bible say about the day of the Lord like 10 times? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Yep. So what has to happen before the day of the Lord? Sun and moon have to be darkened. Well, isn't that interesting that in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, it says that after the tribulation, 
sun and moon are darkened, and then Christ comes in the clouds to gather the elect. But you see, it, this is what I'm saying, people. It comes a point where people who refuse to see theirs are just liars at right. some point. At right. some point, they just have to be seen for what they are, a liar, yeah. who sees it and they know it and they just refuse to admit it because they're a liar, because they're a coward, because yeah. they want to be everybody's friend and everybody's buddy. Yeah. At some point, they need to be either called out as a hyper-dispensational, works-teaching heretic, yeah. other gospel-teaching heretic, or they need to just be uh, called out as a liar. Mm -hmm. Now, if they've never studied it, that one thing, but if people are going to study this and walk away, uh, still pre-trib, either they're an imbecile or they're not saved or they're just being uh, extremely stubborn, which makes them a liar because they're refusing to admit what they see. And you say, well, you, you, know, you got all radical on this uh, from the conference. Hey, I've been saying the same thing since back in 2012 when I made my post-trib moments. Watch post-trib moment number 60. I said, hey, if you watch all these moments and you're still pre-trib, you're either an idiot, not saved, or you're the, just being stubborn and refusing to see it. And I stand by that statement. And I think that the vast majority of them are just being stubborn. Yeah. Yeah. Or they just haven't even looked at it. I mean, look, when I tried to talk to my pastor back home about this, when he broke fellowship with me, you know, sends me into the hottest part of the battle, literally, and then withdraws the troops from me. I'm talking about Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> if that's not the hottest part of the battle, then you must be in Death Valley, California at that point. Hey, my pastor sent me to start a church in the hottest part of the battle and then withdraws all blessing from me, withdraws the troops from me, breaks fellowship with me over the issue of the pre-trib rapture. And then when he's pinned down with questions to defend it, here's what he said. Well, I haven't really studied it. Well, isn't that interesting how you'll break fellowship with somebody over it, but you haven't even studied it? But that's the story with 99% of these pre-trib pastors. They haven't even studied it for themselves. They're just repeating stuff that they've heard. And that's why, isn't it funny, when they, when they have to defend themselves against after the tribulation film, they have to bring in a specialist. Oh, wow. They have to bring in evangelists and missionaries and specialists that will come in and teach their people. They can't even get up and teach it themselves because they don't even understand it themselves. And many of them are just refusing to look at it because I've pinned some of these pastors down and proved it to them from the Bible. And then after I proved it to them from the Bible, they said, well, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure you're right, but I need to study it and digest it. Talk to them a year later, still studying. Two years later, still studying. Three years later, still studying. Five years later, I'm still studying it. Why? Because they're putting it off and putting it off. They don't want to be held responsible for the information. They want to have plausible deniability. That's what's going on. But the Bible says here that the timing of the day of the Lord is the timing of what he just told us about in 1 Thessalonians 4. And that matches perfectly with everything else that Christ taught. But look at verse 3. And let's go even deeper with this. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. The they and the them is talking about the unsaved, right? Mm -hmm. They say peace and safety, destruction comes upon them, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Again, remember I was telling you that watch means to be awake? Yeah. Well, that's why he says don't sleep but watch and be sober. So what's he saying here? He's basically saying that a lot of Christians are as asleep as the unsaved. Mm -hmm. So the unsaved are the children of darkness. That day is going to come on them as a thief in the night. But here's what he's telling Christians. Don't be that guy. Don't be like them. The unsaved, it will come upon them as a thief. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. He says, don't sleep as do others. Who are the others? The unsaved people. Don't sleep like them. Be awake. But sadly, most of even saved Christians today are asleep. They're not heeding this admonition to be awake and to watch. And look, if you're pre-trib, you're automatically asleep. Automatically. Because you don't even know what to watch for. You don't even know what you're looking for. You're not even expecting the thief to even come. You just think that you're going to be just beamed up 
with no warning, with no suffering, with no time leading up to it where you're going to have to make some hard decisions about what to do with your life during that time and, and, and how you're going to handle that. So the Bible says, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. We have hope of salvation. Why? Because God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we see these things begin to come to pass, we will look up and lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. Super clear, isn't it? Super clear. And you know what? This is super clear. And we didn't even look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is even more clear. And we didn't even look at Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or Luke 21 that are all super clear. So to be pre-trib, you just have to ignore super clear, super clear, super clear scripture one after the other and just refuse to admit what the Bible's saying. Go, if you would, to Luke chapter 12, where we were before. Let's get back to this parable. So the parable makes perfect sense. Christ is teaching that which Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians 5, right? Watch, be awake, don't let it come upon you as a thief, right? Be awake, be sober, be watching. And Jesus, of course, said at the end of Mark 13, what I say unto you, I say unto all, Watch, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. You don't know if it's going to be in the second watch or the third watch, so you got to stay up all night, right? You stay up all night, and when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whoso readeth, let him understand. You know, that's when you know that it's going to happen. Now, in Luke chapter 12, he said in verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. What's he talking about? Being awake. Leave the light on. Now, we already covered verses 36 through 40. Be therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. But look at verse 41. This is pretty interesting. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speaketh thou this parable unto us or even to all? Now, Jesus does not directly answer his question. He doesn't say yes or no. But the things that he says next will answer the question of whether this is being spoken just to them or to all. Now, when he says all there, that's everybody. That's even referring to even unsaved people. Okay. So when he says, are you saying this to everybody? Jesus is going to answer him by now including unsaved people in the parable. Because when he, when he first gave him the parable about the thief here, he's actually just talking to the saved. He's telling the saved to be ready, okay? Just like Paul is telling the saved, hey, don't sleep, you know, be awake, pay attention. So he's dealing with the saved, but now he's going to deal with both saved and unsaved in the next part of the parable. Why? In answer to the question that Peter gives. So you got to stop and pay attention to the question that Peter gives in order to understand the next few verses because Peter asked the question, hey, is this just for us or is this talking to everybody which would even include the unsaved. All right, look down at verse 41, or verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. Verse 45. But and if that servant... Say in his heart. Now, some people will try to apply this to saved people, but no, this is talking about unsaved people, and I'll explain to you why in a moment. And it's in response to the question that Peter asked. But and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men's servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware of, and he will cut him in sunder, meaning cut him in half, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him 
they will ask them more. Now, in order to understand this parable, you have to get the context of the rest of Christ's teachings because Christ gave this parable over and over again about a lord of a household who goes on a far journey and then comes back. And he finds the servants have taken over and rebelled and mutinied, okay? For example, you remember the famous parable where Jesus talks about how the Lord of the vineyard, he goes off into a far country, and while he's gone, he sends his servants to the vineyard to, to receive the fruits thereof. And what did the servants of the vineyard do? They beat them up and sent them away. He, he sent more servants. They beat them up, made fun of them, and sent them away. A third time, right? Then, last of all, he sent his son. And he said, they'll reverence my son. But when they saw him a great way off, they said, this is the heir. Let's kill him. And let's see, we'll seize on the inheritance ourselves. And they killed him. What's the Lord of those servants going to do when he comes? He's going to miserably destroy those murderers and he's going to give the vineyard to others who will bring him the fruits in their due season. And then he explains what it means. He tells the Jews, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So some people will mistake this parable and they'll say, oh, well, if they're servants of the Lord, they must be saved. But they're not servants of the Lord, Lord. They're servants of the Lord in the story. Okay, the Lord of the manor has servants in his vineyard that are supposed to be bringing in the fruit thereof. They're supposed to be doing the work. And what did they do in this story? The servant said, oh, my Lord delays is coming. He's not coming back. And what do they do? They begin to beat the men servants and the maid servants. And they begin to eat and drink with the drunk. Look, this is what the Jews did. The Jews are the servants who knew the Lord's will and did it not. Mm -hmm. And they'll be punished worse than the Gentiles who did not know the Lord's will and did it not. Okay, because the Jews, we're supposed to be the servants of the Lord. And instead of bringing in the fruits of the vineyard, serving God, what did they do? They rebelled against God and they beat the maid servants and the men servants, who are those people? Well, in other parables, Jesus equates those servants that they beat up to, to the prophets. So the prophets that he sent unto them from other countries or the prophets even from their own country that preached to them were killed. They, we, you know, Jesus said, which of the prophets have you not killed? Which of the prophets did you not persecute? Right? So these servants that are beating their fellow servants and eating, drinking, and saying he's never coming, these represent the Jews, okay, that, that rejected the Lord. And this could also just represent unsaved people in general who believe that, you know, Christ is never coming. They say, where is the promise of his coming? Mm -hmm. For all things continue as they were uh, from the beginning of the creation. And so those who knew the Bible are going to be held to a higher standard than those who didn't know the Bible. They're going to be punished worse. And, and see, that's why the Jews were punished so severely in Christ's day. And that's why they will be punished severely again in the end times because of the fact that they are supposed to know the Bible. I mean, who do you think is more accountable to know about the Bible and the true God? A Hindu or a Jew? You know, I mean, think about that. Because, I mean, at least the Jews have got some truth because they have the Torah and they have the Tanakh and they have the actual script. Now, they have a bunch of other lies that they mix with it. But they're accountable for having heard real scripture in their life and knowing who the God of the Bible is. And they know who Jesus is. And they are held very accountable because unto them were committed the oracles of God. So obviously the Jews who rejected Christ, that's why he said it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for you. He said you're worse off being a Jew at the time of Christ and going to hell than being one from Sodom and Gomorrah who went to hell. Or, or, or the men of Nineveh, you know, would rise up in the judgment and condemn them. The queen of the south will condemn you. He said it'll be more tolerable for Sodom than for you. That's, I don't think Sodom is going to have a, 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 an easy day at judgment. Right. 
I mean, you think Sodom is just going to have a smooth judgment? They're going to have a serious judgment. That's why he's using that as an example. He's saying, guess what? For the Jews, it'll be worse. Why would you, how could anyone in their right mind join that religion? Think about what you're joining. Yep, sign me up for the worst possible judgment. You know, sign, sign me up to, with the Christ killers. You know, sign me up with, and you know what? People, people get uncomfortable with that. They say, how dare you say the Jews killed Jesus? What did it say in Luke chapter 11? Yeah. We just read it. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Right. Look what it says in Luke 11. Let's back up and see it again. It says in Luke chapter 11, Verse 50, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Jesus is blaming the death of Abel on the Jews. You know, people are like, oh, you're blaming everything on the Jews. Right? How dare you say the Jews killed Jesus? Well, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the Jews both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. P Peter preached them and said, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Okay, but right here, Jesus is saying, even Abel was killed by the Jews. You say, how does that work? I thought Cain killed Abel. Why? Because it's the same spirit of Cain that is the spirit of Judaism. Right. So he looked at the Jews and said, I'm going to require of you. I'm going to blame on you. I'm going to hold you accountable for the blood of all the prophets from Abel to Zacharias, from A to Z. Right? Abel, the first martyr in the Old Testament, right? To Zacharias, the last one killed in the Old Testament for the faith. And he says, it's going to be required of this generation. And you know what? He wasn't talking to the Gentiles. Right? He's talking to the Pharisees. Yeah. He's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the people who screamed, crucify him, crucify him. The people who said his blood be on us and on our children. Yeah. So why don't you just back off on saying, how dare you say that about the Jews? Well, how dare Christ say it about Abel? Right. Now look if you would at Luke chapter 12. I got to hurry up to get through this. But it says that the Lord of that servant will come in a, in a day when he looketh not for him. Why? Because he's not looking. He's not watching. He's not paying attention. He doesn't even know what to look for. He doesn't even know what the signs are. Go to Luke 21. This is pretty interesting. Look at Luke 21. This is the very end of Luke 21. And you'll find something pretty similar here. He says in verse 34, he says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. Now, let me just start out by saying this. In this chapter, Luke 21, one of the things that really stands out is the difference between ye, you, your, and they, them, theirs. So when he's talking about the unsaved, he says they, them, their, you know, and, we, and, and you know what's funny? Whenever he talks about Israel or the Jews in Luke 21, he says they, them, their. So it's bizarre that people say that this chapter is toward the Jews because every time he talks about the Jews, he says they, them. And then when he talks to the Christians, is ye, you, your, right? Your redemption draweth nigh, but there's going to be all this wrath on this people, the Jews. Okay, that's what he said. Read Luke 21 when you get a chance. But... He, when he says you, I mean, here, this is one where he's talking to his disciples and he's saying to them, you, okay? Because he distinguishes in this passage, they, them are the unsaved. He says, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. Now, remember, that's what the unsaved are doing. They eat, drink, and are merry because tomorrow they die. And he brought that up in Luke chapter 12 as something that the unsaved do. They're, they're eating, drinking, beating the servants. But it says here, take heed to yourselves, let's say time, your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. You say, what's surfeiting? Surfeiting and drunkenness? Let's just say partying and drunkenness, right? That's probably a word that we would understand in our vernacular that probably gets the same point across. You know, just partying, drunkenness, cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares, watch verse 35, 
For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So to all them out there, the unsaved, those that dwell on the face of the earth, it's going to come upon them unawares. It's going to be a snare to them. It's like a thief in the night to them. But he's saying, don't you be like that. You don't want that day to come upon you unawares. So he says, verse 36, watch ye therefore, yes. right? Watch ye therefore, watch this, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So you say, well, Pastor Anderson, why watch? What does it even mean to be ready when Christ comes? Now, the, to the pre-tribber, the only thing you have to do to be ready is just to be saved, right? I mean, if you're pre-trib, you only have to do one thing to be ready, just be saved. Because if he just shows up, you're beamed out, it's fine. But what about if we actually have a biblical understanding of the fact that there's going to be the tribulation, the abomination of desolation, persecution, affliction, a time of trouble such as the world has never seen? What does it mean for us to watch? Why be awake? Why be ready? Does it mean, hey, you better have your MREs ready? Hey, you better have your water filter ready. Is that what he's saying? Hey, you better stockpile enough ammunition. You better, you better have the bunker ready. That's not what he's teaching. He tells us why we need to be ready. He tells us what it means to be ready for the Lord at his coming. He says, don't let your heart be what? Overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Why not? Because you don't want this day to come upon you unawares. Why not? What does it matter if it comes upon you unawares? Listen to what he says. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and what? Pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What does it mean to watch, to be prepared, to be ready? It's not talking about physically being a prepper. What it's talking about is to be paying attention and praying to the Lord to protect you. Praying always that you'll be counted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, a lot of people, they, they wrongfully have this idea that there's pretty much two options in the end times. You're either going to go hide somewhere in a bunker and survive, or you're going to gloriously give your life as a martyr for Christ. Right? This is what people think, like, you're either going to gloriously, boldly preach and, and be beheaded, or you're going to go hide somewhere and cower in a bunker. But you, but you know what? There are a couple other options of what could happen to you in the end times. And, and this is going to really drive home why it's so important to, to, to watch and to be prepared. There's another option of boldly preaching the Word of God and surviving. Because God can protect you. But you know what? It's going to take prayer. Now, the pre-tribbers have never even prayed this prayer, ever, because they don't even believe in it. So that puts us in a pretty good position to get answered, because we're actually praying the right thing. If we pray, Lord, please account us worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. You know, we're likely to be answered, since so much of Christianity has failed to even pray that prayer or even understand that prayer. But then there's yet a fourth option, right? Because we think of the guy who's hiding in the bunker with the MREs. We think of the one who gloriously dies for Christ, which is great. Amen. If that's our, if the, hey, if that's our destiny, amen. Even so, amen. We sometimes fail to think of the fact that you don't have to compromise. You could boldly preach and win souls to the bitter end and survive because God protected you. Amen. I think there's going to be a lot of that. But then there's a fourth option that I bet most people have never thought of. And you know what? This is where a lot of Christians who aren't ready are going to end up with this terrible fourth option. These are, your, these are your Christians who are into surfeiting and drunkenness, right? And they're not paying attention. They're not awake. They're not ready. They're not praying. This is your typical watered-down pre-trib Christian. They're going to end up in category number four, sadly. 
You're backslidden, Christian, or the one who's living in drunkenness or fornication, when these things come to pass, you know what? They're going to end up in category four. And you know what that is? To die in some other dishonorable way. Hello, it's the tribulation. You know what people are going to be dying of in the tribulation? You know what they're going to die of? Starvation. Yeah. There's going to be great famines. And you know what? If you seek first the kingdom of God, then all these things will be added unto you. And by the way, that's from Luke chapter 12. So don't say I didn't preach on Luke 12 tonight, because I did. <laughs> Preaching a lot of stuff from Luke 12. Hey, he said, if you seek first the kingdom of God, food and raiment will be added unto you. What if you're not seeking first the kingdom of God? Is God guaranteed to feed you when you're living in fornication, when you're living in drunkenness, when you're out of church, when you've quit serving the Lord, you've quit soul winning, you've quit reading your Bible, you don't even care about the doctrine, you don't even know what's going to happen in the end times, you skipped all the prophecy sermons, you skipped the book of Revelation, you skipped Daniel, and you know what? You think God's just guaranteed to feed you? I hope, I hope he does, but you know what? He might not. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Right. Hey, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he will provide and feed and clothe you. But when you're backslidden, and you, and you know what? The one who's not ready for these end times, he could be in a position where he finds himself starving. So let me ask this. Would you rather be beheaded in a split second and feel a split second of pain or would you, and be a, greeted in heaven as a glorious martyr of Christ? <laughs> and handed a white robe and cheered on? Or would you rather slowly pine away of starvation because you're so backslidden, God's like, well, I got other, people. you know, you, you, you had no time for me. You didn't pray to me at all. You're, you're a disgrace. I'm ashamed of you and you're in fornication. Nuts to you. Okay, what about this? How about dying in warfare? There's gonna be, the whole world's gonna be at war. You don't think that's gonna kill a lot of people? And you, you think that no Christians are going to die in that warfare? Oh, yeah, they will. But you know what? There's no reward for dying in that war. You're not a martyr if you die in that war. You're not a martyr for starving to death. What about the pestilence? You know what pestilence is? Disease outbreaks. During the time of the tribulation, disease is going to break out, mass plagues, unlike the world has ever seen. Earthquakes. You think people are going to die in those earthquakes? Earthquakes, warfare, famine, pestilence, disease, starvation. Hello? And you say, well, what does it matter? What does it matter if we know what's coming? Why do we even need the prophecy conference? What, why do we even care? Why does it even matter? It's not even relevant. Okay, I'll tell you why. Because when you see those things come to pass, you better be dropping on your knees and purifying yourself right. and saying, you know what, man, I got 75 days left. It's time for my live-in girlfriend to move out. <laughs> right. You know, or even before that, even years before that, when you start seeing the one world government coming together, when they start saying, hey, we're going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, yeah. when you start seeing the signs of the false prophet or the Antichrist, look, the more awake you are, the more you're going to see. And, you know, that's an extreme example of somebody who's living in fornication. But you know what? Everybody has little sins in their life and little things. I guarantee you, you're going to tighten that up yeah. in those last few months. Right? right? Yeah. You're going to tighten that thing up. You are going to be on time and you're going to be at soul winning and you're going to be doing, you know, whatever those things are in your life, you know, you're going to be like, okay, now it's time to quit smoking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Think about it. Now, the pre-tribbers have such a warped view. They say, well, yeah, but our view is even better because you feel that way all the time. Except, guess what? If you feel that way all the time, then you never feel that way. Yeah. Nobody's on edge all the time. <laughs> Are they? You think you're just 365 days, he's coming back today. I better get my, I better get my act together. He's <laughs> coming back today. No, no, no. No, they're not. To be always, to be always Awake and ready and light burning is to be never. Why? Because you can't stay up every night, every day, every week, every month. Just, it's today! You know, it's, you, you, nobody can live like that. Right? 
The point is, we don't know when it's going to happen. So here's what we do. We serve God. We work hard. We do our best. But we're always paying attention. Mm -hmm. And we know what to look for. And we're ready so that when we see these things come to pass, hey, we realize, you know what? He's coming. Right. It's time to light up that lamp. Yeah. It's time to get ready to roll. It's time to stay up all night. It's time to make sure that we're ready to face what's coming. You know what? It, you said, well, what are you guys going to do? Go build a bunker somewhere? I'll ne I'm never building a bunker somewhere. Amen. You know what I'm, why would I? If I got 75 days left to serve the Lord, if I got three and a half years left to serve the Lord, I want to use every day. Amen. Why? It's the last chance. Yeah. Yeah. It's the last chance. Why would you go hide when it's the last chance? Yeah. Okay, what, if, what about this? What if I could go hide out in the woods and survive? Or what if I could just even win one person to the Lord? And you say, yeah, but what if you're killed? Okay, so how painful is it going to be for me to be guillotined if, that's, if, if the worst happens, right? You might not even feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You might not even, you'll probably, it'll probably just be such a shock to your brain, the lights will probably just go out. But you know what? Let's say it hurts really bad for 10 seconds. <laughs> worst case scenario, okay? Worst case scenario, like that old story in the Thousand and One Arabian Nights where the guy gets his head chopped off and he can talk for 10 more seconds before he's gone. <laughs> Nobody else has read that except me. Okay, that's all right. Worst case, it, oh, it hurts bad for 10 seconds. You know what? I will go through 10 seconds of excruciating pain if I can save somebody an eternity of hellfire. Right. What kind of a person would say, no, don't put me through 10 seconds of pain, maybe. <laughs> Let that person go burn in hell for eternity. That makes no sense. Mm. And you know what? I'm not going to win one person to the Lord during that time. You're not going to win one person to the Lord during that time. We're going to win five people to the Lord. We're going to win 10 people to the Lord. We're going to win 15 people to the Lord during that. We're going to win 25 people to the Lord during that time. We're going to be out there working hard and doing great exploits for the Lord. Yeah. We're not going to be hiding. Amen. But the pre-tribbers have this straw man. Oh, you're just into guns and prepping and, and storable food or whatever. Not me, brother. I'm going to be out there screaming my head off, preaching the word of God until the bitter end. Amen until the bitter end. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best at the end. It's like you run a long race. See, the Christian life is like a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? See, the pre-trippers are telling us just sprint the whole time because you never know when the finish line's coming. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, I don't know, this might be the finish line. This might be the finish line. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. Pretty soon, you know what you're going to do? Like, I don't think this finish line's coming. Yeah. So then they're just chill all the time. But then they claim, like, yeah, yeah, we're ready all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can tell by your life. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell by all the pre-trib churches in our town that are just ripping it up on soul winning. Yeah, right. I mean, they're just going nuts because they know they only have a little time left. But see, the true story is that the Christian life is like a marathon, right? Where you're cruising along at a steady pace that you know you can maintain, right? You don't want to just burn the whole tank at the beginning. So you're cruising along at a steady pace you can maintain. But as you get toward the end of the race, you realize, you know what? There's only a little time left. I know I'm going to finish. I didn't start too fast. I didn't burn it all off too early. I know I have a little time left. And so now I got nothing to lose. There's the finish line. And you sprint to the finish. Yeah. Amen. You sprint to the finish. But, but, but they're running it with their eyes closed. They don't even know when the finish is. <laughs> but what's Jesus saying? Open your eyes, be ready, so that when you see the finish line, right, you can sprint to the finish. Yeah. When you see the finish line, you'll know. And, and by the way, you're, you're actually going to be able to pray the whole time that you make it because you even know what race you're even running. Mm -hmm. It's not like we don't know, is this a 5K? Is this a 10K? Is this a half marathon? We don't know what we're running if we're pre-trib. But with, with the Bible doctrine here, he's saying, look, you watch. 
And when you see it getting close, you ramp it up. Amen. You ramp it up. So that's what it means to be ready. Amen. It means to be prayed up and to be living a godly life. Why? So that God will protect you so that you can have a glorious finish. Amen. So that you can either survive to the end and be one of those that are alive and remain, which would be awesome, right? Amen. I don't want to die. I'd rather just live through the whole thing and just make it the end, right? Or you could die a glorious death for Christ. Yeah. Or you can just be a backslidden Christian who a rocket lands on their head. <laughs> right? I'm serious. Or you could just be some backslidden, lame Christian. Oh, I don't know what's going on. I thought it was going to be pre-trib. You know, and the next thing you know, you're picking up some disease. And you rot away of some disease. It's, they're more than just the two options right. that, that people are thinking about, folks. Uh -huh. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this great chapter, Lord, in Luke chapter 12. Help us, Lord, to be ready. And, and not just ready in the sense that we're saved. I, I think the vast majority of people here tonight already have that taken care of. We already know that we're saved and going up in the rapture, Lord. But help us to be ready so that you're not ashamed before us at your coming, Lord. You said you'd be ashamed of, of many of, of your people at your coming. Lord, help us not to be those people that you're ashamed of where they, they end up dying a stupid death, Lord. Either, either let us survive or, or die a glorious death, Lord. But help us to serve you and earn rewards and please you and that you will... Uh, uh, gird yourself and serve us, Lord, and, and, and welcome us home as opposed to us uh, being a, a shameful black sheep of the family. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.